All right, I got to start this show uh, by asking Kevin if he has passed any kidney stones. I meant to ask last week, but I got caught up in Pikmin seeds. Did you pass any Pikmin seeds or kidney stones, Kevin? No seeds nor stones. I'm still, I peed in the pee strainer only five minutes before we got on the chat tonight. Not a nary a stone to be found. I found, the, and this is this is like a few weeks ago. One time, I found one little brown speck that got caught in the strainer mesh, and I was like, "Oh fuck yeah, it's happening now! Here she comes!" And then nothing. It was a giant cock tease. Wow. What if it comes out like sand, like just like pure? I would ocean love it sand. if that would happen i don't think that's gonna happen i think it's going to come out like a giant piece of coral as a matter of fact oh man it'd be beautiful you need to photograph that thing from all sides okay <laughs> let's start fine time step into video game land welcome to fine time <laughs> Hello, party, people, it's your boy Dre. It is the fine time. As you heard our uh, fabulous new drop at the beginning say, uh, I hope everyone enjoys that because I had an idea and now it's here. So get used to that shit, Steve. Oh, yes. Raise the roof. Whoop, whoop. Are, okay, are you trying to be as white as possible, like at up front, <laughs> or just have Have you seen me on the on the uh, webcam here? It doesn't get much whiter than this. I mean, I'm looking at you right now. You are fairly Caucasian, I will say, but I mean, you can't be more Caucasian than Kevin. I got my buddy Holly cassettes right here. <laughs> 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 oh my god cassettes <laughs> cassettes like not even oh man that is just no, no the, 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 the whitest of the whites have cassettes they haven't upgraded to cds yet oh man that is some that is that is something i don't even know where to go with that i think we should just <laughs> leave that whiteness where it is so i guess i'll start first as typically happens around here Um, I want to start with a little thing. I haven't got my James Lipton on in a while. I want to talk about a little thing called R-Type Final 3 Evolved. So a little background for those who don't know. R-Type Final 2 came out a couple years ago uh, for PS4 and Switch, if you dare. I played it. Steve played it. We came. We saw. We conquered. After many, many continues, we conquered. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> Steve just had war flashbacks. Uh, Bido, son, aren't you? Cut? <laughs> oh, man. Believe it or not, that was like less white than what you said earlier. OK, so <laughs> and then um, so our type final three evolved is largely a port of our type final two with some of its DLC tacked on now using Unreal Engine 5 with seven new PS5 exclusive stages in R Type Final 3, acting as like a new campaign of sorts. So, R Type Final 3 Evolved is a PS5 only product. For some reason, you want to dip your toe in these waters if you feel masochistic and then you have PlayStation Plus Royale with cheese. You can play R Type Final 2 for PS4 right now on it if, if you dare. But my comments here will be exclusively reviewing the seven new PS5 exclusive stages. So, Like I said, this is now running on Unreal Engine 5. The new stages do have some graphical flourishes that are really cool that the original stages don't exhibit. Like the first stage, you're it's almost like a Darius game with the way you're going through like lush greenery and there's like a waterfall, you know, that type of shmup shit. Shmup shit. Wow, that's hard to say. Shmup shit. Uh, Kevin, say shmup shit five times fast. I'm a little scared to talk now that I realize we have this new whiteness rating system. <laughs> oh, God. I'm, Don't I'm worry, I won't accidentally say like, oh, you know, I, I had cantaloupe for breakfast and you're going to be like, oh, you white piece of shit. No, it's OK. You can have cantaloupe. Come on. Give me some oh. shmup shit. 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 It's not that hard. Oh, wow. OK. See, I'm afraid. I'm I'm kind of afraid. Yeah. Anyway, um, like the metallic surfaces and like water reflections, all the stuff you might expect 
from like a PS5 shmup that uses like 3D graphics on a 2D plane, you're going to get here. It isn't like the highest budget of games. I mean, the original R-Type Final 2 is kickstarted after all, you know, so don't go into this expecting like something like super grandiose. But from like a modern shmup, this looks really good. Those reflections I mentioned earlier, they're like low res, but like super effective for the art style compared to like if you go back and look at our type final two, like you remember stage three, Steve, with like all the ships and stuff and like how Mm. matte those kind of surfaces look. Now, those things would look reflective. They didn't update those old stages to look that way. But I think you know what I'm trying to say. It looks a lot more like the surfaces are supposed to be. The theming in these new these seven new PS5 stages are really on point. Like the second stage has this like it takes place in a raging snowstorm, which seems like it would be counterintuitive for like a shmup because of like to have something that's like poor visibility. But it really works, you know, it, and it's like a take on the typical R type like this. This stage is an entire sh- Bido ship. You know what I mean? And like, that's the whole stage that they do sometimes is kind of a take on that since eventually you go underwater and beat the beat the big Bido thing underneath. So that's cool. Like I said, the first stage is cool for us. The six is like this gear turning mechanical wonderland thing. I think like tick tock clock on steroids or something. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I love the theming in these seven stages. The seven stage, the last stage is your typical apocalyptic uh, R type bullshit. It's great. So I think the only drawback is that there are no alternate paths and routes in these stages, which is kind of an R-type final staple. Steve, as you know, we were trying to figure out, like, how do we get to 6A or 6B or whatever the fuck? There's none of that here. It's just the seven stages, and that's it. A a bit dull. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. But, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe they just didn't have the time. It is... I don't know. I, I, I it is disappointing, but I'll, I can get over it because the stages are good. Um, so now the question becomes this. If you've already played our type final two or rather bought our type final two in the case of us, is it worth essentially double dipping for these new stages? And in my opinion, the answer is a resounding Yes, these new stages look and feel great. They could have honestly been sold by themselves as its own game, and it would have been completely justified. But on top of that, you're getting all the R-Type Final 2 content. Steve, I actually really recommend this to you just because like you and you didn't buy any DLC for the first for the R-Type Final 2, did you? So like you're getting some DLC packed in here, too along with the R-Type Final 2 content, as well as seven new stages. I don't see why you wouldn't. I mean, well, I don't have all night to discuss how economics work, but, uh, you know, I, I, if I bought every game I wanted as soon as it came out, I, I'd have no money at all. Oh, my God. That's 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 the angle we're taking here? Wow. I, I mean, there's a little game called Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom coming out Friday. and Yes, that means you can definitely not play R-Type fucking Final 3 Evolve. That, that, that absolutely means that. I mean, in the time it takes to play that, maybe it gets a price drop and maybe I won't pay $70 for our type it's not, final it's two. F- first of all, it's 50. Okay. Just like the first game. Jesus Christ, $70. Now, then even then I'd be being like, eh, you know, let's not, you know, $10 a stage. Let's not, let's not be doing that. I don't know. I, I just think it's a little shitty of them to do the whole Remember the prize we gave you of letting you change the title screen at the end that they basically did that for a product. But now it says evolved. (gasps) Holy (laughs) shit. That's so much better and different. (laughs) My, my title screens, my title screen says Bido burst five evolved. Okay. It's different. Yeah, that's, that's much different. You're right. I'm sorry. I was way out of line. Be forewarned though. If, if what I said sounds appealing about our type final, our types are very tough games in general, even by shmup standards. And our type final two was no exception. Like that game was really difficult. Uh, Steve, remember the triangles? How long did it take you to pass the triangles? Oh, I didn't. I, I did an entirely different path. Oh, wow. Okay. I thought you beat the triangles for some reason. Oh, no, the triangles beat me. The fact that we do a lot of triangles on the fine time logos is pretty much exposure therapy for me. Sorry. Sorry for triggering you. (laughs) No, Um, it's fine. I got to overcome it sometime. But 
I understand. Um, the new stages in R Type Final Three Evolved are harder than R Type Final Two, Steve. So just be forewarned. If if this is like you want to cut your teeth on a shmup that looks and sounds cool like a modern shmup, this ain't it. This is for experts only. And I am not an expert. So I died and died and died until I got it right. But I did. Uh, but if you don't have that kind of wherewithal, that kind of fortitude, stay away from something like R Type Final Three Evolved. I, I mean, and I literally just told you how I didn't do a path. I did a different path, and I beat it eventually after losing so many, many more continues. So y- y- think about that at home <laughs> before you <laughs> buy this one. Yeah, you you may be in for it. Uh, and look, and there's no alternate pass here. If a stage is too tough, you're just going to have to tough it out. So um, anyway, so we need to talk about something here in – A little thing. I'm doing it again. A little thing called A Little to the Left. We've been talking about this game on and off on Fine Time for a while now because (laughs) let me a little background about what, like two Indie Worlds ago, right? We didn't really find the presentation all that interesting. So we did. We largely didn't talk about it. But I insisted Steve talk about A Little to the Left because he had such a hard on against it because why again? Tell tell the people. Because you all have a drawer at home. If you don't have a drawer at home, you have a bigger problem than finding out what kind of entertainment you have. (laughs) There is nothing preventing you from doing this shit in real life. This isn't even like power washer simulator where you might live in an apartment and then, oh, I could pretend to have a power washer for a few hours (laughs) and have fun with that. No, you have a drawer. Organize your fucking drawer if that's a problem. If you don't have a drawer that needs organizing, come over here and clean my house. This is that was that that is such an apocalyptically bad take. I can't even like I can't even bother to break down how bad that is. That is a terrible. No, no, no. Tell me. Tell me why the game's good, Andre. Tell me why sorting shit in a drawer with a cat nearby is fun, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Am I I, I getting am I getting loot out of it, Andre? Am I am I am I finding gold coins like in Dragon Quest? No. What, 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 what? Come on, Andre. I need you to tell me what, what, that, that, that it's fun now. Come on. You know what you sound like? You sound like one of those asshole dads who are like, you know, the kids are sitting inside like on a Sunday, like watching NFL or something. Why don't you go out and play football for real no, instead? No, no, no. This That's is what he way fucking more sounds entertaining like. than that. No, no. no. I, you just let Steve do this. this. This is good. This is good content. We should almost have Steve triggered by a little to the left lock behind a paywall. It's that good. I mean, my God, this should be no, our Patreon. Because, no, because I understand that. No, you're not going to ever play real NFL and you're not not going to be a real rock star so yes th- things like madden and guitar <laughs> hero will be fun for certain people what you about have a drawer. dogs did 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 nintendo nintendo set you off like this no because you can't have it you can't always have a pet where you live I, show I, me I, one I, house without a drawer in it <laughs> show, show me a house where you have a video game but you don't have a drawer <laughs> People this without is... drawers are really fucking offended right now, by the way. At me in the comments, people without drawers. We're getting, all... we're, we're getting, we're getting canceled by the drawer list this week. Come at me, drawer people. You know what that sounded like? I, I, I want to hear from you. First of all, shut up. Secondly, <laughs> remember the uh, chili discourse on Twitter where it was like, you know, someone brought chili to their neighbor and I was like, well, what if your neighbor doesn't have a mouth? How are they going to eat the chili? Like, that's what that's what <laughs> that's what it sounded like. You know, like people were just like making shit up and it's just like, oh, my God, I didn't think we we're going to have this kind of chili discourse. Anyway, you simmer down over there. I'm going to tell you why this game is good. I'm waiting. Oh, OK, so what basically what we saw in the indie world is exactly what you get here. You arrange things according to size or shape or color or markings or what have you, but they don't necessarily tell you that. Here are all the objects. Arrange them in a satisfying way that you feel satisfied about. Oh, that wasn't it. Okay, let's try this. Okay, cool. You move on to the next puzzle. If you even want to call it a puzzle, it's a chill out game. I would almost barely hesitate to call it a game. And, you know, in my opinion, like being a non-game isn't necessarily bad. Especially when it comes to like, here's some nice music. Here's a chill vibe. Here, what you're gonna you what? What do you want to say? It's always good. I knew the music was gonna somehow make this a 
experience for you. I'm like, yeah, you know, because like music is part of the video game, no matter how much you always say, I can go on YouTube and hear the music. Yeah, no. you could have turned you you could have went on YouTube, turned on a little you could have turned on a little to the left music and organized your real drawer, Andre. Yeah, see, there he goes. There he goes. He's doing the thing. Any fucking way. Uh books on the shelf, tomato sauce cans, pencils, pasta shapes. You, you know, it's it's pressure free. It's nice. I get to sit there and relax and arrange things. Okay, so fuck you. I don't. I don't care what you have to say about like I can arrange my drawer. Why would I arrange my drawers at home when I can arrange the this on on the TV with a cat? Yes, there's a cat. The first, you know what the first puzzle you do, Steve, is you you align the picture of the cat on the wall because it's crooked, and then you align it to be straight, and then the game begins. What do you think of that shit? I think you're reaching in a way to try to spite me, and even you are having a hard time believing your bullshit. No. <laughs> no. Okay, no. I'm just going to keep saying no until I believe it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, let's get to the accusation at hand, right? Yes, they make prominent use of the cat, okay? But if you came here particularly for cat shenanigans, you might be slightly disappointed. It's not like the cat makes an appearance in every puzzle. Oh, here's his paw, like messing up things like every two. But that doesn't very that doesn't happen very often. They really dole out the cat, almost like what I say about the original Kingdom Hearts is that they really dole you out the Disney over those out. Like you really got to work for the Disney. They're not just going to give it to you up front. You got to really play the game. That's how this works. You got to really work for the cat like in real life. So it it, it feels at first it feels like cozy window dressing just to have the cat around. Right. Instead of like an actual feature until. There was one puzzle <laughs> I did. Who, what? An actual feature. In no, the I mean, it's not sorting I mean, shit in your house. <laughs> I mean, you are just this is such a bad take. <laughs> It's such a bad take. I just anyway, <laughs> one of the puzzles. I w- I'm waiting for all the angry comments. I, I will feed on them this weekend. <laughs> I mean, you are just you are something. One of the puzzles was simply to set the table, right? Like like plate, fork and knife, right? Simple. But then they had the asshole cat like just keep coming and messing it up when you're almost done like seven times in a row. It did this to me. And then all of a sudden I tried it again and then it didn't do it. And then I won. I was like, okay, was that the puzzle just to outlast the cat? I don't, I don't understand. That was weird. And then, though you do get maximum cat at the end. Yes, I'm going to spoil a little to the left because I know you guys totally care. There's like a puzzle game sort of sequence thing at the end, like a falling box puzzle game where you arrange the Tupperware into like rows so the cat can keep climbing up and up and up until the cat gets to the moon. And that's the end of the game. The cat goes to the moon. Why wasn't that the game? I mean, because that's kind of boring. I that's think. more of a game than most of anything else you described. Nah, I beg to differ. Okay, chill, chill music while arranging pasta corkscrews is a game. All right, you you can sit there and stare at me all you want. Invite. I'm, I'm not coming to board game night at your house because <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> Oh yeah, a board game <laughs> night at my house where you just were, where we just the drawers I, I, are coming out. Yeah, I just dump a bunch of pasta on the on the table and then um, sort the, sort these pastas in alphabetical order. Steve. Yeah, isn't this way better than Hero Quest, guys? You get to sort these pasta shapes. Um. Okay, so there's like a hint system, right? Because not all of these things are obvious. So where the hint system that essentially shows you a picture of the solution, the completed puzzle. Or you can just skip the puzzle or what do they call it in the game? I think they call it. Let it be where you just like, okay, you just go to the next thing. I'm not too proud to say I use this sometimes because some of the shit just didn't make any sense. Sometimes like there was one where like there was like knickknacks in a box and there was like, you had to hang tools like on the wall, like here's your saw, here's your wrench or whatever. But then the tools kept swinging and knocking down other tools. So I'm like, okay, well, fuck you. I don't want to really, I mean, I guess I'm going to the next thing. I don't know what order you want me to put these tools on the, on the shelf here to not have them knock down over another tools. That's not very chill. That's not very vibe. 
fuck this. So I moved on to the next thing. Um, there was like scenes of leaves, more than one scene of like just leaves on the ground that I had no idea what to do with. And then when I went to go look at the hint, it looked like goddamn hieroglyphics. It's like, here's a square and an X and a circle. And then like there's like red X's on stuff like don't put stuff here. But what does that have to do with leaves? I have no idea. So I just went to the next thing. I'm like, OK, I literally do not know what I'm supposed to do here. So the game isn't perfect. There are definitely puzzles where it's like they're just not going to click with you. And it's like, I, I, I don't get it. Right. Um, there was one where you had to burn the candles down to all like the same length, but it had to be the same length on the screen that they determined that they don't tell you about. So I made them all the same length, but I guess that wasn't where they wanted me to do it. So I'm like, OK, I guess I'm skipping this. I don't know what. I don't know where on the screen I'm supposed to have all the candles at. So never mind. So it's not perfect. Right. But for 15 bucks or whatever I spent on it, I think it was 15 bucks. Yeah, it's a pretty decent puzzle game. That's the last year. What? Four or five hours. I guess there's going to be DLC soon, as we talked about last week. And if this sounds like your kind of thing um, uh, outside of Steve's uh, very, very bad takes, it probably will be. So definitely go for it. If this sounded appealing, it will be to you. I think for my $15, I'll just keep it my $15 in my wallet and leave it be as, as the game says, according to you, that's rude. I'm so, but- I'm, I, I'm so here for, for you guys arguing about a little to the left. This is my favorite thing. I mean, I know you've been eating this up like a lapping it up like a hungry cat. I might even oh, yeah. say, <laughs> um wow i've talked i've talked way more about video games than i plan to uh steve i'm sure you just played a fucking indie game that was way better than my uh cat arrangement indie game cat arrangement because you arrange cats drawer arrangement indie game right yeah not only did i play a video game andre a, a real video game I, I got a platinum in a video game my, my oh first my one. god and, and it wasn't even in a fake game either like i am mayo where you just turn it on and you watch mayonnaise spin around for half an hour and they go oh here's your platinum that's what you do in that game <laughs> i don't know I, I i'm assuming because that's what everyone gets their platinum in half an hour and they're like 50 cents guys go get your free platinum <laughs> wow that's crazy. anyway Tales of Iron, because my goal was to try and beat as many small games as possible before Zelda comes out. That 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 did not work out. But guys, it's charming as hell. You guys know Redwall, had the the children's fantasy novels where there's mice living in castles doing medieval shit. Am I no oh, those? Yeah. Well, no, I don't think we got Redwall in Canada. Okay, come on, Kevin. Books exist in Canada. Sorry. Despite all my bo- jokes, come on. <laughs> <laughs> The creators at uh, Oddbook Studios very much do, and they do just enough of hiding of it so that it, this could be called a tribute to the point where the castle they all live in is literally called Crimson Keep. I mean, it's it's not subtle. No. Anyway, this is the Souls-like I brought up last show. You, you follow a fairly linear narrative where your kingdom is invaded by frogs, and you got to take care of them as well as the giant insects that have come to feast on the other dead rats along the way. That's always the fucking frogs, huh? Jeez, those frogs. Bunch of fucking frogs, let me tell mm-hmm. you. There, there, there's quests, but it's really more of a... The quests are largely required to finish the game. It's just ways to give you money that forces the story along. So and is this like to, a 2D game or like it's what? It's 2D. It, it's very 2D, very, fairly artsy. You, you fight, it's side scrollery and you have to uh, very carefully fight everything unless you get killed in a very in few gaping blows and thankfully unlike other 2d games like this like salt and sanctuary fuck that game very much they actually ease you into what's up by you know gradually giving okay here's your sword that's how it works then now block now parry and then, and then by by the time you're about a half hour and you pretty much get what's going on as opposed to uh, Salt and Sanctuary where they just say, fuck you, here's all the controls. You have to fight all these menaces with all the weapons and armor of varying types. And in addition to, are they stronger than what I got on now? You got to concern yourself with weight, you know, for those dodge rolls that everyone likes. My favorite. Everyone likes a dodge roll. And resistances because, you know, what's great for fighting frogs might get you ate by mosquitoes. 
you got storage chests all over the place, so it's not really that uh, it's hard to you know swap out when you get killed, and you are going to get killed. You'll probably save by one and make adjustments fairly easily. But it's not overly easy. Learning the patterns is fairly rough going, and as great as the animation is with giving you tells, you still need to have faith in, enough in yourself that you can parry or are close enough to break a stance outright. But it is very satisfying as hell to deliver a death blow to something that you spent a few tries on, watching the guts spill out, hearing them all go, and then having the narrator go, Reggie killed the bastard. He killed him good. Or, you know, something very, uh, you know, <laughs> akin to it before picking up your loot and moving on to the next part of the story. But I sound. I feel like the frogs deserved it. I don't know why I'm being so mean to the frogs right now, but... But you see, when you see the frogs, you're, you, they do deserve it. And we all got this free with Royale with cheese last month. So, you know, it's right there. We did? Yeah, I couldn't put it down. So... That, that, that that's my glowing review and speaking of royale with cheese this month we got chivalry 2 i remember this the original being fairly popular about a decade ago on steam and since it was on steam i'm like well i'm never playing this because even though yes i know steve has a wii u ha 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 but you know that also meant i wasn't going to friends houses and be like hey can i try some chivalry because no, no one i knew was playing on steam chivalry but, sounds like something that has a grid that i'd be scared of no it's not it's a first person medieval combat game it's not a shooter it's medieval combat first you, person you, yeah you, you, you play online with like up to 64 i think is the number other players at once oh boy you you have death matches or you have numerous other scenarios that you know you, you're pretty familiar with andre where you that you play as one of the two factions like escort this shit capture that thing over there rob them of this shit over here and so on and so forth to you know just th those kinds of multiplayer scenarios and it is janky as hell you have to make very deliberate motions to attack as the different classes with different attributes and you need to pl plan for that or you just get swarmed by three guys at once and you say, oh, fuck it. And then you respawn as the next. It's oozing with personality. It's a lot of stupid fun. And th there's an overarching storyline with the factions, but who gives a shit? It's a lot of yelling and stabbing. Unless you think you're hot shit with the bow. Like you, you could hide in the back and then and, and try and shoot guys at the bow. But there's friendly fire with or without the bow. Like you, It's very easy to just start stabbing your own people if you're not careful. Admit it. You thought you were hot shit with the bow. Oh, no, I am not hot shit with the bow because <laughs> uh, it, there, there are points where it's uh, it's clear that, okay, I could hide behind this shit and maybe get a few shots off with the bow. Sometimes, uh, well, most times, all times, someone's going to get wise, run past the other guys, and then just stab you with whatever they got handy. He's like, oh, okay, I'm dead. I'm, time to respawn to something else. And you can do all that. And, you know, there's other crude dialogue that they just show each other that's more akin to the, the Renaissance Fair where the Black Knight has an I hate peasant shirt on more than, you know, an actual medieval fantasy game. You know, it's it's fun. We're not paying for it. I, I, it's about what I expected it to be. You mean the Black Knight doesn't say, know your place? No, it's far, far cruder. <laughs> no. Well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Look, I, I logged in a lot more time than I figured I would already, but it, I, mean, I, I think it's fun for what it is. I do not appear to have Tales of Iron on PlayStation, so I think I missed this somehow. I don't know how. Oops. But I guess I don't. Oh, well. Oops. You done fucked up. I fucked it up. Can I log into your account, Steve, and play Tales of Iron? It doesn't usually cost that much, Andre. <laughs> Oh, it looks like it's 25 bucks. Okay. I can't afford this. I much. think maybe after, maybe wait till a day when you haven't talked about a little to the left with Steve until you ask him for anything. I mean, I don't feel like I talked about it so much as he just bullied me into. He's just looking a little resentful over there. I mean, geez. I mean, do I really? I just talked about two vi actual video games that I liked this week. Actual. See, hear that shit? Actual. Actual. I didn't even bring up how much Advance Wars the one and two reboot camp shot the bed towards the further I more I played. Oops. That that might be that might be its own podcast actually. So uh, yeah, that uh, might that might break Steve tonight. I don't I, I I I don't I don't talk to myself though. So Kevin, what did you play? <laughs> 
Well, this might feel like a little bit of, of deja vu for you guys. I played Wario where to get it, uh, get it together. And I know you guys on our previous creative endeavor ran through this after I gracefully exited. I wasn't on at that point. So now it's my turn. Yes. Um, what do you think? Of I want to, I want to, I want to start out with a fairly major gripe, and this was just with replaying this. Um, so when I wanted to start this over, I could have went through all the levels and just, you know, re-ran through the mini games again, but I wanted to start over and do the story from scratch. And I feel like for a game like this, that's, you know, it's not a very long game. That's something that they would likely expect you to do to get replay value out of here. And I had to delete my original progress from this game on a system level, right? So any of my um, high scores from the high scores mini games or anything i'd unlocked i did i had actually done a bunch of the like character customization for the different colors for the (laughs) outfits or whatever all of that's got to be gone which just kind of pissed me off a little bit because it would have been fun to go back and you know kind of revisit some of the high score stuff it just seemed like a strange choice for a game like that not to just like open a new file and retain the rest of your progress but Oh, sorry. Did you, did you have something? Uh, well, no, I was just thinking like I I was going to say that no other warrior wear game lets you do that, but it is what 2021 or whenever that came out. Right. Maybe they should just kind of let you clear your story progress only. I don't know. I it mean, seem, it seems like it it'd be weird. a pretty simple thing to implement. And it was it's not a deal breaker, but it did. It just pissed me off a little bit. That is weird. Um, I play warrior wear for the articles. <laughs> Well, <laughs> high nose Steve over here today. Jeez. I played a little to the left for the music. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so just I guess it's kind of the, the main thing that I think this game was critiqued over was just the choice to have all of the characters presented in game rather than just directly controlling the mini games. So I don't think overall that this quite works as well as just direct control. Um, but I also I'm really glad that they did this. I think it's well, maybe it doesn't quite hit the same highs. It it felt, you know, a lot fresher and newer than, you know, just having a, another pile of mini games to play. Um, and I think they implemented it really well. I, I think it, there, there had to be a lot of design thought go into that because so many of those characters play so wildly differently to be able to make every one of those mini games compatible with every one of those characters. It doesn't feel like that that hampered anything. Um, and and on top of that, having all of that variance uh, with the abilities for those characters add, added a lot to it. Um, you know, obviously some of them I like better than others, but it was also nice that they, for each level, as you unlock them, they would make you use the one you unlocked for that level. And then you could pick the rest of your team. Um, so it was, it was a good way to make you kind of try new things, but also not, you know, just ongoingly force you to use characters that, um, you don't enjoy the mechanics of as much. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I thought that. I kind of thought the same, like when I first saw it revealed in whatever direct it was, I was like, okay, just because I could control Dr. Craig or whatever doesn't make this, you know, I, you're right, though, it was a necessary step because, and I've said this before, and especially now that it's on Game Boy Advance and Nintendo Switch Online, the original WarioWare is one of my favorite games of all time, like no joke, absolute, absolute stone cold classic. You can't fucking touch that game. That game is incredible. Every audio quirk, every mini game, every everything, every weird little sound effect, you know, like it it nailed it. It was bizarre. It was weird. It was quirky. It was the best. You can go back and play it infinitely. Some other Wario where games you can or not. Like, I'm a big fan of smooth moves. I don't know how other people feel. Uh, but like, I, I love smooth moves. Smooth too. moves is good. Yeah, yeah. I really like that one a lot. I think my probably my overall favorite one is WarioWare Touched, which is probably an unusual choice. But, you know, that's just, just me. This one, I think I didn't go back to as much just because I missed the mini games. There just wasn't like any of those like you know, Dr. Wario or like you can play Sheriff and now you're Wario. Like you need those kind of things. I feel like WarioWare really relies on that stuff and get it together. Doesn't have any of that. 
Yeah, I, I think I yeah I, I agree with that. I think even just as far as as wanting to revisit it, maybe just they, like they had that kind of like you know they're making a video game motif and the bugs have infiltrated everything and aesthetically that game looks really good. But I didn't I didn't find its identity maybe as distinct as as something like um, smooth moves, right? Smooth moves always you know the where they would like give you each move you know the elephant and it would be kind of that like you know awkwardly classy thing or or whatever and that that I think j- just for like being able to remember that identity something like that would stuck out um a little bit more than this did but again not to not to shit talk this at all i i, I enjoyed it the first time and i really enjoyed revisiting it as well that's good it's really um, good it, and one more thing, so just just a real quick note back to um, Horizon Forbidden West. Uh, Andre and I talked about Burning Shores last episode, and while I said I really liked it, I um, you know poo pooed minor portions of it. But I just want to give give a quick uh, shout out to Horizon. I almost never once I once I finish the game and hit the ending of something, I almost never go back and do post game stuff. Um, and I've actually found myself in the last couple of weeks over and over and over um, almost daily revisiting Horizon for um, about an hour or so before work every morning. Um, and I, I'm still getting a lot out of it. I found a lot of like really interesting side missions that I never would have found unless I went looking for stuff to do. Um, some like really unique moments that that it's pretty impressive that they're, you know, quite out of the way. Um, and I think also ju- uh, we, we talked when we talked about Burning Shores, how like insanely good that game looks now it looked good at at launch it looks insanely good now so i think just to like i'm just getting more and more out of soaking out the the graphics on playstation 5 uh whenever i turn that on so a little bit of self-indulgence you know what i didn't know until i saw the digital foundry on it is that you could fly through the volumetric clouds like on Mm -hmm. the on the thing i didn't even bother to try to get up that high and Uh, try to do that until I saw them do that. I was like, well, I just didn't even think that could be a thing. Oh, it's a thing. Right. It's crazy well, they, how that works. They definitely did in the base game. They restricted your height to a certain amount. So, yeah, there's definitely something that could probably be easily missed when flying on burning shores. Yeah, that's probably it because they're like, oh, I'm too high. I need to, you know, whatever. But you're going to see too much pop in, guys. Let me let me go lower. But, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, in burning shores, you can fly right through them clouds. It's super impressive. We will be right back with a lot of juicy big questions. We got juicy ones. We'll be right back. Fine time. We are back on the spiritual sexual level. Whoa, when's the last time I said that? It's been a while. I should consult the fine time wiki. (laughs) Oh my God. If we ever get popular enough to have a wiki and people just tracked how many times I said like, you know, penis power or something, or I I don't know what, like it just, it it would be... (laughs) sexy shower stats yeah it's kevin's shower stats of who is showered with who how video many times game land is a land where video games are <laughs> hey now it's built in now it's built into our, our intro drop okay we are always now going to video game land i never have to declare it again okay a lot of shit happened these last couple of weeks a lot of juicy stuff that is just right up our fine time alley so let's just get started kevin um this takes a little bit of setup for those who don't know, but you you go ahead. Yes, so I guess preemptively, I have affectionately titled this segment "Kotaku Are Big Giant Titty Babies," and I feel like it's <laughs> it's appropriate to make that clear. So before we before we get get to the modern news, let's take a little walk back in time to uh, October eighth, twenty twenty one, when Metroid Dread released. On October 9th, Kotaku posted uh, an article titled "Metroid Dread is already running on Switch emulators." Uh, so in this article, they originally stated. 
Um, hey, real quick, if you are a Nintendo lawyer or employee, just like don't read this. It was a silly mistake. Ignore this blog. You can go now. OK, everyone else. <sighs> What kind of late nineties blog shit is that? <laughs> That's yeah. Right. That's like something you'd see in a game. FAQs like article. Hey, mods don't read. Okay. Anyway, like, no, it gets, it gets juicier. So if you want to play the rest of the Metroid franchise and don't want to shell out large amounts of money on old consoles and games, your best bet is also emulation. As is often the case, Nintendo, like most game publishers, is really bad about maintaining access to their past games outside of a few big sellers. Thank God for pirates, emulators, modders, and hackers. After explicitly talking about a game that day, that came out the day before. Um, so now it is important to note that this article now reads... There's an editor's note that says, per request by Nintendo, we have updated the article to generally reassert that Kotaku does not promote or encourage piracy. Kotaku declined to enact changes that blurred the line between suggestions and aggressive line edits to preserve editorial independence. And then there is also an update from October 10th. (laughs) An earlier version of this story was understood by many readers to be a direct suggestion to illegally download this just released game. We regret this interpretation and apologize as the original article did not meet our editorial fucking standards. Get real. Get fucking real. Okay. Uh, revisiting this that was like worse than i remembered everyone remembers when this happened and we talked about it on our previous creative endeavor steve where we were just like what uh-huh. the fuck like you gotta be kidding me that was actually worse the revisiting that via kevin was worse <laughs> than i remembered steve no it, it was already bad enough that they were coming i was like so yeah you could just steal this game that just came out a day ago <laughs> It's just unbelievable. And now they have the nerve. Well, Kevin, go on. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, they, it's shame. obviously it's obviously worse than they remember as well. I don't think they remember it very well because on April 26, uh, a senior reporter for Kotaku, Ethan Gok, Ethan Gotch, uh, uh, tweeted, it's preview day for Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, a huge game I would love for Kotaku to be able to inform its millions of readers about firsthand. Unfortunately, Nintendo still has it blacklisted from advanced coverage a move i would argue is both unprofessional and coercive hold on hold on you hear the word you hear the way he worded that they have it blacklisted from advanced coverage they have it they didn't say they blacklisted no. them <laughs> from advanced coverage because everyone else had it including like fucking like kit and krista and shit right but they, it, it, no it, it blacklisted them from advanced coverage they declined to say obviously i mean he couldn't have been stupid enough to think that he was covering that up though could he because that was the day the internet was full of tears of the kingdom previews like yeah. everywhere everywhere so it's so just like nobody was fooled if, if it makes him feel better fine time also didn't get preview copies of the legend of zelda tears of the kingdom so he's in good company i guess <laughs> so 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 as you know i mean i i get all the this is the address of fine time right here you guys you know i could have i could have had that shit for weeks yeah, Nintendo, if you're listening, if you do start sending us advanced shit, it's going to make Kotaku mad jealous. <laughs> Come on, mm-hmm. man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then fast forward a few days, that same writer uh, posts an article on Kotaku titled Everything We're Learning About Zelda Tears of the Kingdom from the Leaks, uh, directly <sighs> referring to the leak builds that people have been playing online and, and um, you know, showing off. I, 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 no words. I don't even know what to say. The fact that it was like this same guy who tweeted that, I didn't even know that for like a couple until a couple days afterwards, because of course mm-hmm. it was like, yeah. what just unbelievable. What goes through their pea brains? Like, okay, Nintendo's being mean to me. This will show them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's the point where if you get to this part in the story, you're going, oh, my God, Kotaku is idiotic. This is ridiculous. This would have been worthy for us to talk about on the show at this point. 
but they really, really wanted to put the little cherry on top. Uh, so Luke Plunkett, who I've, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I've, I've seen Luke Plunkett around on Twitter multiple times. And I think he's, he's been, been famous for a few explicitly bad takes. Um, but, but this one really takes the cake. Uh, he tweeted for the record, this is how I feel about publisher blacklists and included a historical image of a pilot in a warplane with World War II era Japanese and Nazi flags yeah sounds great guys huh and the the the, the japanese developer publisher won't give us any previews so let's just post world war ii i i i don't know how you get there in your brain i really don't know I, i i almost don't even know what to say steve it speaks for itself what, what AOL chat room are they all hanging out in where they got that picture <laughs> <laughs> to just post up there? It's called it's called Slack now. I think they're their AOL chat rooms keyboard. Yeah. Uh, their AOL chat room keyboard Kotaku. It, it escalated pretty goddamn quickly. I, I I don't have it it written out here, but he did go on and post an apology, alleged apology, a few days later, making up some like bullshit story, like oh that was just the first picture I grabbed of a war pilot or something like that. So you know, <laughs> oh I, I just didn't I didn't like draw the correlation between the Japanese and the Nazi flags on the plane. That was an accident. Well, and then he also okay. couched it with like. Most people knew what I meant or whatever. And it's like, shut <laughs> up. Don't fucking yeah, couch well, no, that. He's, he's right. Most people knew what he meant, oh. to be fair. <laughs> oh, we knew what you meant. Don't worry. Yep. Yeah. We so, all knew what you meant. As as is tradition on, on Fine Time, we, we present a story and then we try and pose a big question to kind of round it out and get our thoughts. So the question that I have really so insightfully come up with is why isn't Kotaku getting early access games from Nintendo? (laughs) Kevin, what is this fucking jeopardy? Come on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, A a facetious question, obviously from a very unserious website, let it be known. I have hated Kotaku for like over a decade. I've never liked them. I've always thought they were bullshit. I hate their sensationalist headlines I hate their articles, which always seem to like intentionally miss the point in favor of whatever stupid agenda their current writer wants to crusade on. I've just never liked their shit at any point in time. I'm so glad they're getting shit on. I, you know, I obviously have no problem with like opinion pieces or even I don't even have a problem with them covering leaks, but don't also be act put out by Nintendo by not getting preview copies at the same time. Either cover the cover the leaks and that's what you're going to do to preserve your preserve your journalistic integrity, as you put it, which you don't have. But if you want to pretend you have some fine, don't also complain about it then and call Nintendo Nazis or a Japanese company Nazis for not giving you previews afterwards. You can't have it both ways. It's insane. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I could have said it any better than that. I mean, I think we're about done, right? I mean, this is the this is the uh, company where journalistic integrity said, "Yeah, you could just." I said it this at the top. Just, just steal Metroid, Bro- Metroid Prime, Metroid Dread, and play it on your computer. I'm, I'm sure. I'm they sure they wouldn't even know. <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you stole Metroid Prime Remastered as well. I mean, at this rate, um, okay, that was a mess. Stupid Kotaku sucks. Here's the big thing from the week is obviously I think I in our preview tweet earlier this week, I think I wrote it as Phil Spencer's big day out, which uh, I wrote wrote that in passing in the notes when we were just talking about like, so we so we're covering how 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 do we want to cover Phil Spencer's big day? out? Okay, (laughs) so maybe that maybe that maybe that (laughs) subconsciously wormed its way into my brain. Um, So. Just a couple days after Redfall had us launch, we don't need to tell you how Redfall launched, everybody. Everyone knows. LOL. (laughs) Yeah, a big time LOL. But just a couple days after that, Phil Spencer went on Kind of Funny. I guess they have like a specific Xbox show or something on Kind of Funny. Who knew? But he went on there and he took all the questions, all the criticism, all the heat. He did it. And there was a lot to chew on from what he said. But Let's start with some general 
I guess impressions is the wrong term, Steve, but just what did you think? We all watched this whole thing. It was long. It was like 47 minutes. If you guys haven't out there, haven't watched it, go watch it. It's fascinating. It's a great interview because you don't usually get to see higher ups talk like this about their own company, you know, like in being this honest about it, Steve. So what, what did you think about this in general? Well, like you, I'm not especially familiar with kind of funny's antics. Like but, but when you were on our chat saying, Hey, Phil Spencer's really spilling the tea here. I didn't log on to the interview expecting a black and green room in microphones, pretty much the Xbox safe space and <laughs> <laughs> where Phil Spencer was going to come out and, uh, the old guys, no, it's not great that red falls running at 30 frames per second. Nah, we wrote a big check with all these games that are coming out in the next year, which is something I really want to go over next month, by the by the way. Yep. Oh, by the way, is do, do you think it's taking place inside of an Xbox? Was that your was that your <laughs> yeah, uh, that solution? Well have. <laughs> I don't know how often you guys watch uh, D- a digital frenzy weekly, but lately Oliver has been in this big purple room. It looks like he's inside of a GameCube. That's what everyone keeps saying. <laughs> anyway, um, these are just very tiny little people. Yes. <laughs> anyway, it's like the Dreamcast. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's thinking. There's people inside. It, it's like the Dreamcast does, except instead of games, it's like Phil Spencer going in there saying, "Look, it's not great that we announced Perfect Dark and it's still not here yet. I'm sorry." <laughs> I straight up keep forgetting they announced that. Honestly, <laughs> I keep forgetting that's supposed to be a thing. Remember what happened to Phantom Dust last last um in the Xbox One generation? They announced a remake, and then it's like, oh nope, now we're just pointing uh porting Phantom Dust from 2005 in 720p or something like that. They left that's all they did. Does anyone remember that? No, oh, I guess yeah, just me. No. Anyway, yeah, they went back on that hard. I feel like that's what's gonna happen to Perfect Dark. They're just gonna port the Nintendo 64 game. Be like, oh, here's Perfect Dark, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I found it refreshing that he was talking that way, but I, I was just, just I, I don't, I just couldn't say I was expecting all of that at once. It's great to hear someone talk like that, though, Kevin, right? I mean, yeah, and I think, I think I, it was a good interview. Also, you, you know, we talk about that being a safe space due to the Xbox branding, but I do think the, the interviewers handled it pretty appropriately as well. I don't think they let him off easily, especially Paris. Like there was, there was definitely some tough questions in that interview, and, and I think he, he handled it fairly well, but yeah, it was, it was definitely um, pretty good. I, like I said, I think it's wild that he even did this in the first place. He doesn't actually have to do stuff like this. Like people always say like, Oh, this is his job. It actually really isn't like you didn't hear Doug Bowser getting out here and apologizing for like Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, right? Like you didn't see that. It, he Phil Spencer doesn't actually have to do this, but he did it because he wants to, and he always faces the music. The, this is going to sound sacrilege, but I don't care. As like a front-facing and brand ambassador, I don't recall anyone better than Phil Spencer. Like I think he's better than Reggie. Like as as far as like getting that message out there, because Reggie, as good as he was, he was always hampered by the Nintendo line, right? Like he always told mm-hmm. that very, you know, he knows who he has to answer to. He knows what he can say and what he can't say. And he's very careful about it. And Reggie did the best job that he could considering the company. Phil Spencer gets to be like even better than that. I think mm-hmm. my pen. I, again, I know that sounds sacrilege, but honestly, it's true. I really appreciate that he did this. And this is the kind of guy I wish was in charge of Sony instead of like Jim Ryan, if you ask me, but you know, that's, that's another topic, but yeah, we, we had that chat um, about half a year ago, just about kind of general thoughts of, of uh, company figureheads. And at that time I praised Phil, um, you know, because I've, I've always thought his, he's got a really good ability to speak honestly and openly and he can take criticism and respond to it. Uh, and he still can maintain, you know, Microsoft positive messaging. He can take accountability, um, you know, and, and still try and, you know, put the best foot forward kind of thing. And I still stand by that. He's really good at messaging. I am kind of at the point where I do wonder if he's the right person to actually be managing 
you know, at the top level of those studios, though, because I and I remember having this conversation quite a while ago. I thought that Microsoft had a good chance at giving Sony a run for their mo- money this generation, not necessarily in selling hardware, but just in 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 actually presenting a, a desirable alternative to the PlayStation Five, and they haven't done that at all right we've talked over and over it's been years and years and years since e3 came out and they're like well we bought 17 developers and we got all this shit coming down the pipeline Mm -hmm. covid came covid went and you know this isn't a problem that's initiated by redfall for me but we are we're you know we're over two years into this console generation and you know they should have something with the amount of money that they've put into buying studios at this point and i and i want this you know, I, I want this for, for one because I want something to play on the fucking Xbox that I spent money on that I've played. You know, what I have played on there has mostly been, uh, you know, like multi platform games. But I genuinely feel like that's good for the entire industry, right? I feel like, you know, especially when PS3 came out, we seen arrogant Sony. And I worry about seeing arrogant Sony again. Um, I, I want them to force Sony, force Sony to stay on their toes. Um, you know, and, and the most frustrating thing about this situation is I don't, when we look back to the Xbox one in that generation, they failed miserably, but it was like, it was interesting to watch. It was kind of a catastrophe from the start, you know, and there was a lot of self-sabotage. This just feels complacent and sad at this point. There's nothing, you know, there's no like grand problem they've had. It's just, uh, you know, it just is fizzled year after year and it's, it's, it's frustrating. You know what's weird, too? If you look at the horizon, LOL uh, pun, like, I don't understand what, okay, they're hanging on stuff like Hellblade 2 and stuff like that. It's like, Hellblade 2 really gonna, like, uh, do what they want for them? I don't really think so. I mean, Hellblade, the first one has a following and stuff, but, like, are people really out here? Oh, man, I can't wait for that Hellblade 2 to, like really set Xbox on fire? I don't think so. This new Forza is going to do just fine, right? But I don't know. What's what's coming? How many times? We've said this a million times. How many times can you say Halo, Gears of War, Forza? Yeah. Right? We've been doing this since the original Xbox came out, for fuck's sakes. Yeah. Did I tell you I played against a uh, Overwatch person named Halo Gears Forza? That was her name. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was great. And that they were, was Phil Spencer. And it was not. And we and, you know, the game has cross as a uh, cross play now. And that person was not on PlayStation. You can tell if they're on PlayStation or not on PlayStation. They were not on PlayStation. So that had to have been an Xbox or I guess it could have been a switch name. But I, you know, who knows? I'm going to I'm going to put my chips on Xbox. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could have. Um. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. And if you look at the horizon again, I just don't I don't see it right now. Anyway, um, uh, there was a lot of interesting stuff he said. So I just wanted to for all of us to just cherry pick something real quick that we found interesting. And I, I guess I'll go first. I found it very interesting when they were grilling him about Redfall that he said their internal reviews or OK, let's put it this way. The actual reviews that came out from outlets were a lot lower than the internal reviews that they had at Xbox. So I guess what he's trying to say is they have people review the game in their own internal testing and give them a score like it's an actual magazine, like actually review the game. But it's like, how can that work? Clearly, these people weren't telling you the truth. Steve, like that's I found that very weird when he was talking about that. Like you got guys like pretending they're magazine reviewers saying. Oh no, this is this isn't bad running at 30 on the latest console. 95. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I've I've heard about that before, and my understanding has always been that that's more of like a third party consultancy that comes in and, and the sole focus is to be honest so that they can have an expectation of where they're going to get at. I, I wonder if this you know, if it was another where they're like, well, it's 30 right now, but 60's coming, right? You know, we've got these bugs, but they're gonna be ironed out. Did you uh, see you know, they had to put might... stickers on the back of the box because the back of the box baked in 60 frames per second? Oh and they my had to put God. a sticker on it saying 60 frames not available after will be available after launch or something like said the, the sticker said. It's like, oh, my God, that was like I first of all, I didn't know Xbox games put that kind of like like frames per second on the back. That's like I didn't know that How was a feature. 
yeah, that's weird. I didn't know that. I pr- probably better stop. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, St- Starfield is not. It's going to be hell of thirty guys, right? There's no way Starfield's <laughs> going to be sixty. I'm just waiting for that to come. Uh, it's it's going to happen. I've been saying that for months. Starfield's going to be fucking thirty. Oh man. Anyway, uh, I thought also one thing was interesting that they want to be more honest about showing the game you know how like sony presentations are where they're always like this is running on playstation 5 in real time this is a cinematic Mm -hmm. this is running on pc in in ps5 spec they always are very very clear about what we're looking at xbox doesn't do that so like especially because you know how like they're going on and on about like with this new forza it's like we're gonna have 4k and 60 and and ray tracing while racing on track they keep making a big point of that to stick it to gran turismo 7 right <laughs> yeah well i think i think because sony got their knuckles wrapped pretty hard what was it like resistance or resistance 2 that they mm-hmm. showed footage and they claimed it was running on ps3 and and I think ever since then, because they really took shit over that one. I think it, it was like a cl- I think it was a kill zone. I think yeah, it was a kill yeah, you're zone. Right. It might have been a kill that zone. That was the one that really and oh god. Remember they first and I remember this because um recently because Digital Foundry did a thing where they like MST3K, like the old like press conferences and stuff, and they were watching that one with all the Sony bullshit. Mm. And it wasn't just that one, it was Motorstorm also where they mm. really misrepresented it they had all this like mud tessellation and stuff which we still barely now got to with this generation you know like even dirt 5 doesn't have stuff like that you know what i mean like let alone like a game like a yes a ps3 game is definitely going to have all this like geometry on the track right that, that just didn't happen mm. yeah all that was bullshit but sony has gotten away from that because of that they took such a hit from that you know, and Microsoft needs to at some point as well realize, hey, we need to be more honest about the way these games actually look. Um, ironically, the one time they did that was like Halo Infinite. And everyone was like, this don't look so good, dog. And then it got delayed for a year. Right. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> remember that they had that showcase where Halo Infinite looked like fucking shit. And then, mm-hmm. anyway, but um, but yeah, anyway, getting back to the point. Uh, I yeah the re- the internal reviews falling low. It's like someone's not being truthful with you. Come on, man. I mean that's probably what they do. But I, the way he was describing it, it just sounded like they invited Rareware to pl- go over and play Redfall, and they're like, "Yeah, this is real great, there, fellas. If you don't mind playing dog shit." <laughs> <laughs> they said they're getting. They said they were pulling in people from Rare yeah. and stuff to, to get this game to mm-hmm. sixty frames a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which look, it's fine. Like we all know, like Monolith did a lion share of work on breath of the wild right like we know like nintendo does that right Mm -hmm. bandai namco everyone from bandai namco to aiding to toze to everybody works on smash ultimate right like that's kind of a thing so anyway steve what did you what what other thing did phil spencer say before we get to the money quote at the end what did what else did you find interesting here i I found it almost candid ish that he's brought up how uh he, he wants to give studios creative control and he gave several examples, but he, he, that I can't think of right now, but I, but at the end he reiterated that it's still on him to make sure there's product that comes out. I, I mean, I just found that interesting. I like, are you really going to throw all your devs under the bus for that one? Because <laughs> you're, you're going to blame that your, your release schedule on you. You want your, all your developers to be wild and free. Yeah, because you let rare ma- because you let rare make sea of thieves and you let hi fi rush happen and uh. <laughs> yeah that was the thing he specifically said like we, you know they're not making you know evil within three you know we let we we quote unquote let them do their own thing which is good but at the same time guys I, you know you know Nintendo yeah Nintendo does whatever they want they also make like Splatoon three. You know what I mean? Or Mario mm-hmm. Pretty Superstars. They know where their bread is butter. You got to do both, I think. I mean, I, I'm more f- focused on, you know, game, games aren't coming out on time. Like, but, but, but holy shit, you know, games aren't coming out on time. No, no, no shit, Phil. <laughs> yeah, they sure aren't. 
Can't wait for Hellblade 2. I don't know why I keep picking on Hellblade 2. I'm sorry for anyone who's looking forward to that, but it's just like, I just can't believe. Are even going to see Starfield this year? <laughs> yeah, I just can't believe that's one of their tentpole releases. That's all. It yeah, just is I, weird. I, I think you are right. They've been standing on that one for a long time, and I don't feel like the first Hellblade, you know, set the world on fire. Yeah, a lot of people like it, but like, come on, right? Like, who's mm. really checking for that? Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, Hellblade 2. Okay, geez. Um, Kevin, I think, uh, what else did you find quotable, interesting from this? Yeah. So we, we've talked, you know, for a long time, quite a bit about how does game pass make money? And, and I actually, I feel like I really learned something, you know, as far as what their strategy is, because I've always thought of, you know, their intent behind game pass being a, a means to an end, you know, eventually we're going to sell more hardware because of game pass. And, and he's uh, had a specific quote about the last generation being the worst genera- generation to lose. This is when everyone built up their library of digital games. Um, you know, he, he goes on after to talk about Game Pass. And I think I've got more of a sense now that, you know, instead of trying to sell more hardware with Game Pass, they're looking to just use Game Pass as that income stream eventually, um, you know, because that's the niche that they've seen that they can carve out for themselves um, that nobody else is, is doing quite like that, where it's like all of the big day one releases, um, you know, so I, I think I've got, I, I still don't know, you know, uh, that I, I, I don't know that I understand the economics behind it, but I think I have a little better understanding because of that quote as to why that push on game passes went so hard for so long yeah you know i kind of agree well you know what let me read the entire quote of what you said because like i said that was a money quote at the end i'm just going to read the whole thing for for everybody's sake so we can absorb it so they asked about the future xbox 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 they asked about the future of Asbox, and he said this I see the commentary that if you just build great games, everything will turn around. It's just not true that if we go off and build great games, all of a sudden you're going to see console share shift in some dramatic way. We lost the worst generation to lose in the Xbox One generation where everybody built their digital library games, Kevin, which Kevin just said. We want our Xbox community to feel awesome. But this idea that if we just focused more on great games on our console, that somehow we're just going to win the console race doesn't really lay into the reality of most people. There is no world in where Starfield is an 11 out of 10 and people just start selling their PS5s. That is not going to (sighs) happen. I don't really have the words to express how wrong he is. I think he is on this personally. Like, can we just say that up for the Steve? Do you agree with this? Am I off base or no? And not to be this asshole, but maybe just maybe what if, and hear me out. What if you actually got to the point where you actually started out cranking some certifiably great games I can only play on Xbox before throwing your hands up in the air and declaring, guys, great games is not the way to greatness for our brand. Yeah, right. How about you try it first, right? They keep saying, well, if we just put out the great game, someone will show up. How about you like try it? Because you haven't done that yet. Like. We see things flip in a generation and in a second, guys. I understand. Okay, no two situations are comparable. So I'm not comparing Xbox One to anything else. But two things I'll just say, and then Kevin can say whatever he wants. One, I think he's wrong about the digital library thing. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but I don't think people are like, well, I can't play all these digital PS4 and 5 games I bought anymore for buy a Series X. It, it's both. People have multiple systems. He's talking about people selling their PS5s to play Starfield. No, people are going to have an Xbox Series X too. People have a Switch and a PS5, right? I- like, it's not, I don't understand what he's talking about. People buy multiple systems, even casual people. And then number two, look at Switch. Wii U was dog shit. Not just it didn't sell well, it was a laughing stock. People laughed at it. It was a joke. That flipped as soon as they announced Switch. And it was like, oh, well, I guess I'm getting that. Oh, man, Breath of the Wild. I guess I'm getting that. It turned. I'm not saying Breath of the Wild is the only reason, but I'm just saying it, it can turn like that real fast for you if you just put out the software. So. I, I, I feel I feel like Kevin feels a little differently about this, but I just don't think what he's saying is true. 
Yeah, I, I definitely don't disagree with him near as much as you do. I, I, I do think that that comment about digital library games does make sense um, to some degree. I, th- I think your your criticism there is more valid where people aren't going to say, well, you know, I'm locked into this platform. But I, I think overall, what I mostly disagree with you with is that I, I, I think sometimes that we you know, can't see the forest for the trees, you know, in, in regards to the kind of the more casual market. I don't think there are that many people that are willing to buy both platforms. And I don't think, you know, switch and anything is a fair comparable because I think switch is such an outlier. Um, I think, you know, for, for us, you know, people that are, are more enthusiasts, I think, you know, the, the idea is we'll go where the good games are, but I, I think there's more, to some degree platform allegiance in a little bit more of a casual market. And I think also when you talk about comparing, you know, apples to oranges, I don't think we've really seen a comparable to what's going on now. I don't think we've seen a platform, you know, do this poorly for this long, right? Xbox one did really poorly. Series X is off to a really poor start. So, I mean, you know, in my mind right now, all of a sudden, okay, let's say this year, the summer comes, they say perfect darks coming right away. Starfield comes out. It's really good. They come out with a bunch of like good first party shit. I think for a lot of people, you know, for one PS five is going really strong. And I think that like just, just some of that confidence in the Microsoft brand overall has gone right. Even if, you know, if they've got a couple good years and you look back and you say, well, they haven't really done anything exceptional for the last 10 years i feel like for people that are more willing to just more likely to just have one platform they're they're not even going to consider flipping over over that i i still believe we live in an era where a few good games can change that i just do I don't think people the digital library stuff. OK, I mean, look, I understand it's not the same as, as it is nowadays, but like the only Xbox I've ever had was 360. And then I got a PS4 after that without any regards to getting an expo. And I didn't even fucking care about that thing. And why should I like I left behind all my Xbox Live Arcade games or stuff on there that I haven't played in forever. Ten years now because I haven't had an Xbox to play them on. And I think that's one thing that's not really reflected in this quote that he also He's talking about like Xbox as a brand. No, Xbox needs to be the fucking console. You can like all the cloud and like Xbox and PC and like all that. Xbox can't just be a name. It needs to become from start from the console. And then everything else can stem out from there. You can't again, just have a there- you can't just have a game brand called Xbox. See if they're. I think if they're looking long term as their main money maker as being Game Pass, that that might be more the perspective. I guess too, when you're talking about switching consoles, you, you know, maybe for next generation, if they have a last half of this generation and they end it really strong, maybe at that point people think next generation about doing Xbox. I'm more thinking in terms, you know, of people who have already bought a PS5. There's just a lot of people, you know. I think people who are who are you know, video games is the primary hobby, even if they don't have a lot of money they'd be willing to invest the money in that but for a lot of people if they're not you know that into it it, it's hard to go out and spend another five hundred dollars on on something you know if it's unless it's really important i guess so maybe next generation they'll have a better shot if they pull up their socks now but if not i think you know the xbox brand is is going to be close to done at that point if it keeps on yeah if it keeps on like this rather I'm sure I'm way off base because I'm the guy on this show that doesn't like a little to the left. But uh, <laughs> yes, that is that's the reason. That's the reason. But I feel like, especially towards the end, Spencer doesn't feel overly interested in making Xbox the console. Did, did anyone else pick up on that? Because he's yeah. talking. About, he's talking about Xbox doesn't need to out console Sony or out console Nintendo, and he's talking about well, my, Minecraft and is doing big numbers in Japan on Switch. And in that case, I'm gonna say it again on this show, especially now that we have a big name saying it. What if Xbox is just the name of, of the game label that Microsoft has, and they have a Game Pass type? app that they or service that is suddenly available on many machines i mean that almost sounds like the direction he really wants to head in because even when he's talking about the the big not direct they're having next month he's like 
yeah, we're going to have Starfield, but everyone should set their expectations at a reasonable level, you know? <laughs> I just, I don't know if I take it as much that he isn't interested in having Xbox be the primary console as he, he knows it's not viable at this point. But it could be if they just had a few things to play, you know, try it. That's what I keep saying. Hey, you know, uh, you know we're if, you know, if we put out the games, OK, we'll put out the games and then let's see what happens. And it can't be Hellblade 2, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry again to Hellblade. <laughs> No, I mean, and, and Andrew's right. They need the games because and all these conversations keep talking about Xbox sales. Like, why do you want the Xbox to, to sell? You don't make money on the system. You always make money on the games and you need to make the games to sell to the people. Make the games to sell to people and then we buy the games that's what this industry is we all know this come on <laughs> yeah and and whether whether it's it's hardware or it's game pass income they they, they need games for either so I, I think the writing's on the wall either way <sighs> okay that was a nice satisfying meal i am full i'm gonna go digest we are all gonna digest we'll be right back <sighs> We are back. We are going to play another round of name as many things as you can in 45 seconds as we did a couple months ago because you guys like that and we like that a lot too. So we're going to play it again. But before we start, I want to ask Kevin a random question because I don't know the answer to this myself, if I have an answer rather. Kevin, do you have a band with a that you're a fan of or even just kind of you would you like that has a perfect discography? Like a perfect. Now, I don't mean a band that has like three records. I mean a band that has at least like six or seven records and you're just like all of them are fire. I I would struggle to say that System of a Down has come out with an album that I think is, some are better than others. So maybe mm -hmm, perfect course. is a yeah. stretch, but, there, you know, a lot of bands I like, I can come up with like one or two albums where I'm like, yeah, that was definitely a, a major low point. I, System of a Down has never had a major low point for me. Interesting. Okay. I think I would even say that I'm not a huge system of a down person, but yeah, whenever I've listened, I've never been like, eh, you know, this one, not, I'm not really feeling it. I've never yeah. said that with them. So it was definitely a little bit. They, they did. They hadn't like found their groove on the first album, but it yeah, was, it was still but, great. Yeah. But most, most bands do not. Right. I mean, how mm -hmm. a killer debut is kind of a, outlier. let me, I'm going to try it. What else? There's gotta be, there's gotta be another something. Well, I have one. And well, I you guys are probably expecting me to say this, but and this isn't the reason why their REM is my favorite band of all time. But th they made fifteen records, and I think all of them are at the very least really good. I think the the least what the least good they could be is really good. Like, what are my least favorite ones? Automatic for the people. A reckoning, maybe around the sun, I guess I would put in the bottom third. I would still say all of those are really good. And they all have songs that I think are amazing. Like Pearl Jam, maybe in my top five bands of all time, they at least have two records where I'm like, okay, that sucks. Right? <laughs> like they have done that before. Um, Talking Heads has a record or two that I think are not good. Um Shit. Yeah. See, like almost everyone else I could be. I don't know. Does Led Zeppelin have a bad record? I don't know. Some people don't really like their last album presence. Maybe that's their second to last album. But some people di ding on that. But even I, I like presence just fine. Maybe maybe Led Zeppelin counts. Hmm. 
But yeah, I don't know, Kevin. Do you have like another? I mean, because like I feel, yeah, that's I keep like running through through bands, and uh, that's a hard question. That's a harder to question to answer than I would have expected it to be. Yeah, I I wasn't I wasn't expecting myself to really have much of an answer. I guess it's REM, you know, big surprise. But yeah, most bands have at least something I would say is subpar. Yeah, I would never say. Some people would say around the sun is subpar. I like around the sun a lot. So. And I'm the outlier saying Automagnet for the people is just really good because people think that one's like the best, right? And I'm just one of those people who are like, eh, you know. This, this one would be a fun one to get tweets about. If anybody has a has a band to suggest that you think has a perfect discography, let us know. <laughs> yeah, let us know. I know a lot of Steely Dan people out there, but I don't think people think every Steely Dan people uh, <laughs> record is good, right? I don't know. Well, I guess we'll see. Yeah, if you have one, <laughs> let us know about it. What? Not no, not that I'm like real. I'm no, I'm no Steely Dan expert, but I struggle to remember a time where I've heard any Steely Dan music that I thought would would I would classify as good. <laughs> oh, that's not your that's not your kind of music at all. I don't. Yeah. I would never expect you to like them. Um, okay, let's play the game. Name as many things as you can in forty five seconds. We're at least going to do two categories here. Okay, you guys fight it out amongst each other. Who wants to go first on this first category? I'm fine. Uh, Steve's choice. Kevin won, so I think it should be on him. Oh, yeah. You did win last time, huh? Okay. You know what, Steve? Why don't you go first? Let's let's have Steve go first. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. (laughs) Okay. So, Kevin, go put yourself in the soundproof booth. Get out of here. Okay, Steve, you ready? Mm-hmm. Gonna what slap gonna them do? palms together and uh, how do you feel though before we uh, before we start? You feeling good? You feeling confident? Or will you beat Kevin? I I, I feel fine, Andre. <laughs> I'm trying to. Pu- will you play the? You are not being a good game show host right now. And I'm trying brand synergy, Andre, and you're gonna pick on me. <laughs> yes, I'm going to pick on you. I'm going to bully you into saying something bad about Kevin while he can't hear us. No, no, that's not fair. May the better men win. What do you got for me, Andre? Oh, my Lord. I want that killer instinct, goddammit. Supreme victory. Okay, what do you got? So, I I should have said this up front, but here are the rules, just in case anyone hasn't heard this game from the last time. So, basically, as the name implies, I'm going to say a prompt, and then you guys, in 45 seconds, say as many things as you can within that prompt. You must say the full name of the game for it to count. Do not say Mario 1. You must say Super Mario Brothers. No abbreviations. Do not say like PUBG. You must say Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Okay? And if there's a discrepancy, if you say like Metroid Prime 2 instead of Metroid Prime 2 Echoes or something like that, I'll probably count that. Right. But just in case, say as much as a name as a game as you can. There are no wrong answers. If or There are the, rather there is no penalty for getting something wrong. So if you're not sure about something, just say it. There's no reason why not. Just keep saying word names. OK, even if you even if you're not sure, don't question it. Just say it. OK. All right. So in 45 seconds, as many first party games for GameCube as you can first party games for GameCube 45 seconds ready go Luigi's Mansion Pikmin Super Smash Brothers Melee Wave Race Blue Storm Pikmin 2 Pikmin 3 Super Mario Sunshine Legend of Zelda Wind Waker Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess Metroid Prime 2 Echoes Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures, Odama, Chibi Robo, Star Fox Adventures, Star Fox Assault. Holy shit, I know all these. That's pretty good, though. Come on. 1080 Avalanche. I'm joking. That's pretty good. All right. All right. All right, that's pretty damn good. You got 15. That's excellent. 
God damn it. I, that's pretty good. Hey, uh, that's good. Pressure, man, for, fuck me. <laughs> uh, you know what? But for some reason, you said Pikmin 3, which is not a GameCube no. game at all. But no. you said it. Um, but you got 15. That's pretty damn good. Okay. So, okay. Of course, I'm going to ask you, do you think Kevin will do better than 15? Oh, probably. You think so? Okay. Um, all right. Okay. He, We're going to call he, him. He's, he's a bit better under pressure, I would think, but we'll see. Okay. Okay. Let's call, let's call him back in. Okay, Kevin, come on back from the soundproof booth. That was way longer than 45 seconds. What were you guys talking about? <laughs> um, I forgot to explain the rules while you both were here. I forgot to set the set the oh. fucking game up like an idiot. So I had to set the rules okay. for the audience. And well, you remember the rules, of course. So, yes. you know, say the full name of the game. Don't, you know, no abbreviations, whatever. Um, you know, if you're not sure about something, just say it because there's no harm in saying something. That's a wrong answer. Just say it. Now, you know? I do have one one question if we can get away with this. And I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the question is, obviously, for, for the last one. So maybe I would be cheating if I got special treatment. We did Call of Duty last time. Can we can we. So if it's Call of Duty and we had to say all of the Call of Duty games, do we have to say Call of Duty Black Ops 2, Call of Duty Black Ops? Can we just say like the subtext of the title if it's always repeating? Yes, you must say Call of Duty, etc. We yes, have you, you have to say, say Call of Duty every time. Yes. That just that just sounds exhausting. <laughs> it is. That's that's the game though. It's a uh, mental it's mental dance. I keep tripping. <laughs> okay, so right. hey, so Steve on this prompt he got fifteen. Holy fuck! That's not okay? good. Yeah, so you uh, got to beat. You got to do fifteen uh, or better. Steve, I farted him. in the soundproof box, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when he when he's in there for his for our next category he might uh hopefully that's cleared out for him okay no, no so here's the prompt kevin all right we want you in 45 seconds to name as many gamecube first party games as you can all right gamecube first party games 45 seconds ready go Okay, Mario Kart Double Dash, uh, Super Mario Sunshine, Legend of Zelda uh, um, Wind Waker, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, Chibi Robo, um, Wave Race Blue Storm. Um, why am I panicking now? Um, 1080 Avalanche. Um, Super Smash, well, yeah, okay, Super Smash Bros. Melee. You set me up for for panic by telling me <laughs> he got on. fifteen. <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, 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 this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm freezing. Oh man. Well, you definitely. Steve wins that round. You definitely got uh, well, If if it makes you feel any better, he actually said Pikmin three for some reason, which yeah, is not a game. He was on a game. roll. Oh, he was on okay. a roll. Okay, but uh, no, you got. I think you got eight there. So definitely, he wins that round. Damn. Well, now the pressure. The pressure's going to be on him. He's going to know your total next time too. So yeah, okay, well, what we're going to do what if one it's more. Two and I look like an idiot. Exactly. Well, hey, you know it could be. You never know with okay. this topic. Okay, so we're going to send Steve to the soundproof booth for round two. We're going to do one more prompt. Go ahead, Steve, to the soundproof booth. Okay. Is he look at look at him sipping his tea in the soundproof booth over yeah, there? I didn't even put I, I didn't even bother to put cheese and crackers in there this time, but uh, uh, I'll ask well, him I on the way no out. Tea, no tea. I know that. Well, there might be left over from last time. Okay, here's our second prompt, and. I know you're okay. I'm going to make a prediction. You're going to groan when I say this, but I actually, I'm going to make a prediction. I think you're going to do better than Steve on this. Okay. This is kind of a tough, mm. believe it or not, but I think you're going to do good on this. Okay. So here's our prompt in 45 seconds. I want you to name as many games that use R E engine as you can. Capcom's R E engine in 45 seconds, name as many oh, games God. as you can. 45 seconds. Ready? Go. I don't think I'm going to do good at this at all. Uh, Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 8 Village. Um, <sighs> Resident Evil 4 Remake. Okay. Um, 
they did they they did something like real popular lately that that used re engine what the fuck was it upcoming games too upcoming games oh in the God. future coming out What, what, what's in the future <laughs> that's coming? It. <laughs> that's it, buddy. Well, we're just Fox gonna have to stay. We're just gonna have to stick with three. I guess. Oh, oh man, I, do Steve's you think, time to shine. Oh man, Are you gonna? Is he gonna do better than three? I feel bad mm. even asking, but uh, I think he is. <laughs> okay. Well, all right, all right, Steve, come back from the soundproof booth. Uh, good to see you. I was there any cheese and crackers left over from last time that I forgot to take out. No, Kevin, the fucking pig ate them all. <laughs> he, Damn, he, he, he well, ate them all, and he still couldn't name game keep more GameCube games than me. Well, I'll tell you this: on this prompt, he only got three. Well, I don't know if I should like my odds more or less. Well, you might. I guess I should hear the prompt first. Well, okay. Here's the prompt. And if you go, if you get four, you will automatically win the game. (laughs) (laughs) I think think he just thought of more. I think he just thought of more answers than he could have had. He's very, he's very upset with himself right now. Okay. Let's just leave him. Let's just leave him uh, to be. Okay. Okay. So here, here we go. In 45 seconds, Steve, I need you to name as many re engine games as you can okay games that use capcom's re engine now future or upcoming ready go resident evil 7 resident evil 8 monster hunter rise capcom arcade stadium that's it. We <laughs> it's over. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, I don't know why he put himself in the soundproof booth. He, uh, <laughs> he, he he's out of here. But uh, I guess he, he he's now coming back to it. Yes. I did you have was, to, did you have to <laughs> seclude yourself in the soundproof booth? You didn't even want oh, to hear. I probably him say didn't. I did. It was the booth of shame. As soon as I took the headphones off, I okay. Yeah, Street Fighter Six is where you were pushing me pretty heavily, wasn't it? <laughs> Upcoming yeah. games, uh, Exo Primal, yeah. you know, like so, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't even. I don't know that I would have even. Yeah, it makes sense, Exo Primal, but yeah, Capcom Arcade Stadium One and Two, you know, like they all use it. So, well, thanks a lot f- for making me look like an asshole. <laughs> sorry, I thought you were actually. I was pumping you. I really thought you were gonna get more than that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I set well, you, up for you, you, you fucking wait until it's my turn to host, and the clue is Buddy Holly Records. Oh my god, I told you not to name anything that white. It's not possible, okay? Come on, man. Jeez. Get, cut me a break here. Anyway, well, that was fun. I it could do a third, but honestly, we should we should save it for another time. We we should play this game more often. I really enjoy doing this. I'm sorry, Kevin. I feel I, I hate feel, this uh, game now. <laughs> I hate it. Oh, so it's not f- so it's fun when you win, but it's not Trash fun when game. I win. Shit game. Wow. Kusoke. I had fun when I didn't win, Kevin. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're not as much of a grumpy bitch as I am. <laughs> did you listen to me at the top of the episode Kevin? <laughs> i know i could barely get in a word in edgewise shit i want to talk about little to the left and he uh, just fucking destroyed me okay well i guess before we get out of here we have another topic uh sort of a wide-ranging one because we wanted to talk about Jedi Survivor and not specifically Jedi Survivor itself so much as just the review process. This is a topic that fascinates me. Um, full disclosure, I've been trying to pull these guys into like a whole podcast episode about this because I love talking about this shit. And I always have throughout the years. But it's no secret that I have thought like reviews for the last like 20 years in games media are basically bullshit. Like I've always I felt that way for a very long time since since my early 20s and Jedi Survivor coming out. Now, what, a couple of weeks ago has basically confirmed why I feel this way, because it, it released a great reviews. I bought it on launch. 
I'm a little sorry I did because it runs like ass. It's not just the frame rate doesn't hold. There is screen tearing that is so bad. And I'm not even usually a person, everybody who gets that mad at screen tearing. It's not something that usually bothers me. It's so bad in this game that it does. It's unbearable. Um, it's the, it's all over the place too. the f- initial planet runs like shit. If you get on the second one, it runs pretty good to a degree until it doesn't. Right. It's so all over the place and I can't take it. So I'm just waiting for it to be patched. And here's the thing, though. None of the reviews mention this at all. And it, I think what it was is that the publisher, in this case, Electronic Arts, promised that there'd be patches. If you remember, guys, that that tweet they had like two two days before the game came out from EA Star Wars, like the the, the mm. Twitter saying, in the coming weeks, we will be patching performance and this and that. Like they were trying to get ahead of it. And it's like, oh, that doesn't feel great. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there's a reason why they did that, because it's unstable as hell. So here's let's start here and then we can ruminate wherever we want. What is the obligation of the reviewer or or the outlet or however you want to take this? To mention stuff like performance and bugs and glitches, even if the publisher promises a day one patch, even if this and that, right? What is their obligation here? Steve, let's start with you. You got to review the fucking game, guys. Warts and all. I don't know why there's even a performance review. IGN, the same site that just put out said performance review, last November gave Pokemon Scarlet and Violet a six, a fair score for a game which tried way too much in a fairly short dev window. I think that's a fine score for people in a, you know, that, that aren't, you know, going to be hopping right on that. Okay. I get it. What would have, what would have happened there if they split that into two different reviews? I I mean, that, that would just be insane. I think it is really bullshit that IGN did a separate performance review after like two days after whatever the, the real review that doesn't mention any of that stuff. I think that is just crap. Like performance is gameplay. I don't know how many times I have to say that bugs and crashes are also like part of your experience. They need to be mentioned. It's not superficial and it does matter. It doesn't matter if your review is dated afterwards because of it. You're reviewing the game that was given to you. You know, digital digital foundry did it right. They put out Jedi survivor videos in its state that it is now. And guess what? It's been like two weeks and there's been like two patches, three patches already, and it still runs like shit. There was a patch like yesterday or something. It's still trash. So, you know, they can promise the publishers can promise whatever they want. But at the end of the day, the game's going to run how it runs. And you can't just take their word for it. You have to review the game that's in front of you, Kevin. Now, I don't know that I think doing a performance review separate from a primary review is a bad way to handle that. Doing a performance review days after is definitely a bad way to handle that. Now, I do think this is a, a nuanced discussion because, you know, I'm sure when there are reviewing r- reviewers are reviewing these games, they're being told there's going to be a day one patch. We're going to iron out this stuff. Now, to play devil's advocate, I also would imagine there's probably a number of circumstances where, you know, they're being told that and then the day one patch goes live and it does fix 90 percent of those issues i bet you there's a lot of builds that reviewers play that launch in much better condition uh than that so i think for the reviewer as the individual not the outlet i mean i think i think that's a, a really difficult line to walk now you know one way that i feel like it would it would you know be rectified which would, would be getting rid of early review copies which i mean you know is never going to happen for obvious reasons um because people want to see the review day, day one when that game comes out and, and reviewers out, review outlets are never going to do that voluntarily um you know because they don't want to risk traffic over having a fair review one thing too i really i think getting rid of number numbering systems overall would be great i would much rather watch a review that just talks about the game and we'll, we'll go on to talk about this later but i do think that it is a valid point and i i think from like you know i'll still go back and watch reviews that came out five or ten years ago so i do feel like there is somewhat of an issue with having that review be dated but obviously that's impacting you know a much smaller audience as far as like making purchasing decisions so i don't disagree with anything you guys have said but i do i think it's a nuanced topic I just feel like 
I don't understand how you can just put that stuff aside when reviewing something, I guess. You know, if your game crashes over and over at this point, or if you're, you know, I just don't like, how do you even, how does that not impact the way you're playing the game? If like this fucking planet runs at like 35 frames a second or something wobbly, like, I just don't know how you can just ignore it. Let, let's just say, hypothetically, if you were a game reviewer and you worked for an outlet and, you know, s- eight out of ten games you get that you play as a review copy are in relatively poor shape and then they launch with a day one patch and then two out of those ten you play in a poor shape and they launch with the day one patch and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fix anything to a satisfying conclusion. So how, how do you address that properly then? Because it is also, uh, you know, the, uh, as much as it, you know, causes problems, day one patches are, are just, you know, they're, they're the way things are now. And if, if that day one patch can fix, you know, the majority of those problems to the point where it's like fully playable for the consumer. It's also probably not fair to be criticizing those things a day before that game even goes, goes on, you know, goes out for sale. I think you're right. However, I have to know, right. I got to know that's coming and I got to know it's going to be fixed somehow. Right. Like I can't just like, obviously electronic arts probably told reviewers, Hey, we're going to fix this and this it's not fixed. Right. Mm -hmm. The day one patch didn't do that. If there even was a day one patch, I'm not even sure that there was, but like it didn't. So, but like there are other games where it does. Right. Or there are things Mm -hmm. that are small that do get fixed. Like um, Dead Space on PS5 had a big uh, VRS problem that got patched out within like day, like within the first week or something like that. Right. Like, and yeah, okay. Stuff like that. Okay. Fine. But if you're just taking the developer's word for it, hey, we're going to fix this down the line, then what do you say, right? There's got to be a hard line of like, we absolutely 100% promise this will not be an issue in the final game. I keep thinking back to Cyberpunk because I remember reading, you know, comments from multiple reviewers that were, you know, very upset with CD Projekt Red that said we were explicitly told when we were given these review copies, we are aware that there are these problems. These are not going to be problems when the day one patch goes live. And and that, you know, people who reviewed the game were quite upset because they said we didn't address those items for that reason. So I just I don't know how to rectify that. That's why ultimately I think you just have to review the game that's in front of you. I understand again, unless you know for sure that's going to be patched. And again, how can you really know that? Maybe it's a yeah. develop, maybe it's a publisher you really trust. Maybe you got inside word from that publisher that like, no, we we promise. We absolutely promise. Okay, fine. But I don't know, Steve. Well, Journalistic integrity like ours is why we don't have advanced copies of Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Andre. So, 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 <laughs> we're, we're not as willing you know, to, we're, we're, we're not willing to lie about how the game is operating. Look, if it runs as good as Tears of, the, of as uh, Breath of the Wild, it'd be fine. If we get a little chunky slowdown and, and when we get to the new, uh, almost said Master Sword Forest, uh, Lost Woods, then uh, <laughs> then fine. Uh, Master Sword for us. God, my brain is <laughs> uh, my brain is just breaking. What happened to me? Um, uh, Steve, we don't have access to the fine time email. I bet you Andre's sitting on three copies of Tears of the Kingdom. That's just what I'm un- saying. Un- Feeling un- fucking, fucking pompous. <laughs> <laughs> you think? Okay, come on, my big mouth. You think I'd be able to keep that to myself? Of course no, not. I'd be telling yeah, I'd be telling you guys all about that shit. Um, okay, I'm sorry to have to talk about Luke Plunkett again, but besides the <laughs> besides Andre, the, I'm sorry we're talking about Luke Plunkett too. <laughs> yeah, I think this, Luke Pl- Luke Plunkett is sorry we're talking about him as well. Yeah, um, I'm surprised he hasn't blocked me yet. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was the solution. By the way, when everyone said like, "Hey, guy, this isn't great," he just blocked them. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, cool, thanks. I mean, anyway, um. He decided to throw his hat in the ring on this issue, and he tweeted a screenshot of his Fallout New Vegas review from 2010, and he added the following to the screenshot. Do you know what happens when you devote a huge amount of space in a review to PC technical problems? One, you get yelled at anyway. Oh, boo-hoo. Number two, your review is shit. Who talks about New Vegas's bugs now? It's an all-time classic, but this review reads like a Reddit post. 
bro, what the fuck are you talking about? That's all anyone talks about still when it comes to New Vegas. Then we still talk about the bugs. <laughs> That's a good point. I was going to say, uh, friend of the show, uh, Select Star Podcast early ep- has an early episode about Fallout New Vegas, and they spend a lot of time talking about the bugs. <laughs> yeah. I told, I've mentioned it many times in the show. Mm-hmm. When that game, I bought that game day one. I couldn't play it for like six weeks until the first DLC came out because I got stuck inside of a casino. I couldn't leave the casino. Mm hmm. And I didn't, I was too stubborn to like go back to a earlier save. I'm like, no, fuck this. I'll wait till they fix it. And they did, but I couldn't play it for a long time. That's, that's the new Vegas experience. And you know what? It's one of my favorite games of all time. Just like a lot of people. I love that game. Okay. And, but you cannot talk about that without talking about the bugs. So it's like, but pushing aside how I feel about Luke Plunkett, very, very tough to do, but I'm doing it right now. I think what he's saying here is like just factually incorrect. Like I said, we talk about the bugs and any review that didn't mention that stuff, Kevin, would be extremely negligent. Now, I know this is different from like Jedi Survivor just having, you know, some performance problems, right? Like New Vegas is an extreme case. There's no fucking way you can't talk about that stuff, right? You don't See, agree. Co- coming, co- well, coming into this, I didn't agree, and maybe, maybe you've swayed me a little bit. I, I, I see what he's saying as poorly as he conveyed it, and and as much as I don't want to listen to anything he says to begin with, I do. Again, I just, I feel like there's there's historical value to like having the overall concept of of the game be accessible, you know, well after launch. I 100% agree when you say it would be extremely negligent for them to come out with a review at launch and not mention that. That that would be unfair to the consumer. So, I, again, I, I think that it's just it's a really hard topic to address. I think going back to it, I do think if there was a way for reviewers to know what state the game would launch at, if if there was a way to separate a performance review from a, you know, primary review as a standard, that would be the way to do it. But uh, how how, do, how does that functionally work in practice? Yeah. This all, I mean, you're right. I can't disagree with what you're saying even though I kind of do, but I also can't, you know. It's <laughs> God, you know, I miss the old days of just like, you know, a pre-release copy would just be a few. I think, Steve, whether it's the other day or yesterday, we're talking about like games that, you know, like because like preview copies and like Game Pro or whatever, they do a guide uh-huh. on it and then stuff in the final game would be different. I remember me and my friend when Resident Evil came out, we were following a Game Pro guide on it. There was stuff in there in that Game Pro guide that was straight up not in the game. And but that that stuff like that would happen because they'd have to get a build so far in advance. Just the Wild West back then when, you know, we all put up with it because from where I'm sitting, I don't know, reviews are more for entertainment. I haven't really used a review to decide, oh, man, is is Mr. Plunkett's review going to be the tipping factor Mm. to whether I buy a thing or not? No, it, it, it really hasn't been in some time. And it's even less than it was when I was younger. It's it's I, I find it's more entertainment that's why i try to be more entertaining with uh, my input here like th- th- did you have fun listening to me talk about a- any of this thing i i hope that would hold up more than any anyone assigning a score to a game that mm-hmm. again may or may not be dated from now who like who cares <laughs> yeah i agree with that i do i do want to kind of push back on like a lot of people saying review and you kevin saying maybe we're past scores I actually don't think we are. Maybe it doesn't need to be one to ten. I do think we need to rate stuff, though, in my opinion. It's just so I, hard to, uh, to like, properly do. I, You know what? Uh, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, no, no. Say it. I wish, and, and it, it's not that it doesn't happen, but I wish this conversation overall would be pushed more towards the developers. You know what doesn't make fucking sense to me? Apparently, like, four days after launch, Jedi Survivor had a patch released that, like, substantially made it better. Now, how long was that game in development? They knew what the state was when they released it. Like, are, you're telling me that, like, there there was literally, they were literally four days too short to get rid of that many of those problems. Yeah, because uh, like, Electronic Arts probably said, hey, we're shipping right now. We're shipping ahead of Zelda. We're shipping ahead of Final Fantasy 16. We're shipping ahead of Street Fighter 6. We don't fucking care. But that's a that's a that's a prioritization problem, right? Yeah, it is like probably I don't blame Respawn for this at all. I blame Electronic Arts, you know, but yeah, I, for, go ahead. 
Go ahead. I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I, I would, I, I get what you're saying by, you know, needing to push it out for a specific time frame for sales, but like development wise, like, I feel like, you know, it wouldn't over, over the period of years, it wouldn't take that much to like realistically get ahead of the four days worth of problems. Right. I'm not saying, you know, like implement crunch, but I think as far as like development pipeline, prioritization that there there obviously is a problem there this, this is why people hate day one patches this is the problems that it causes yeah and well like we said they they knew it too because they had that tweet hey in the coming weeks we're gonna improve this and this they said that before the game came out they were trying to get ahead of it didn't save mm-hmm. them any face but you know they did say <laughs> I think it. They also had had a tweet that said something about make sure your drivers are up to date for your PC. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that yeah. fucking helped. <laughs> and then their very next tweet, they did the whole like picture, you know, because they had so many words. We 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 heard that some some configurations on PC, <laughs> some configurations, <laughs> some Steve. <laughs> Yeah, which which ones? Yes. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seen a thing within like in the last day or two. I don't remember what it was on, but somebody was saying something about Redfall. Is this this is the new crisis for for PC because no PC can run it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if it can, it still looks like shit. <laughs> it doesn't look like crisis. I did I tell you I at E three two thousand six that was the crisis E three that shit looked mm. unreal. I did not believe that was like a real thing running it was only Mm -hmm. like a video you had to like be special to go actually play it but like i was like this isn't a game there's no way this can come out this isn't real sure enough you just had to have like you know thousands of dollars worth of pc equipment to be able to do so i think steve is done hearing us talk about this though he's giving me the look i know the look (laughs) oh are are we finally done i don't know do you want us to be I, i mean i mean guys don't you think it was just a little bit sad that we were able to fill an entire episode based on around people who make more money than we do being a bunch of crybabies? Oh, <laughs> we shipped an incomplete game on purpose. Please don't drag us. Eh, <laughs> we advocated for piracy. Why won't Nintendo invite us for play dates anymore? Microsoft <laughs> keeps sliding over other games when we just want Call of Duty, which is in my diaper. <laughs> and you got Phil Spencer showing up on a comedy podcast thing branded around Xbox, sitting in an Xbox, and he's doing the sports coach on TV thing of, well, we meant to make the good plays, but when you're out on the ice, you can't always score a touchdown. And that was the closest we got to accountability in the past two weeks on this stuff. Take your lickings and move on. You all keep telling us that working in games is real hard work. But if I knew you were all allowed to just stand around and point at the customers like a little bitch, maybe I would have tried to get in the door a little harder. Wow. Okay, you know what? I got nothing else to say. I think we're just going to end the show now. Jesus Christ. I didn't know I'm you had a ro- restraining order against Steve because I'm just scared now. Yeah, just just get out of here. Go hide in the soundproof booth. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap us up. Okay, uh, Find Time Podcast on Twitter. Everyone knows the rest. Goodbye, everybody. Ah! <laughs> You've been listening to Fine Time.